Well, I have the privilege this morning to be able to introduce um, our plenary speaker this morning and really the flow of this morning's plenary session, how that'll go. Um, Dr. Peter Cha, uh, he is uh, an associate professor of pastoral theology at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, uh, where he's been a professor there for 14 years. Um, uh, Peter Cha has served um, not only as a professor, but in a number of different uh, ministry settings, a variety of different ministry settings. He served in the Korean Immigrant Church in both youth and young adult ministry. He served on campus ministries, uh, such as InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, as well as has been involved in church planning. Uh, today, he's also a board member of another very important organization called the Catalyst Leadership Center. It's an organization that really is a leadership development organization for uh, Asian North American Christians. Today, he's also a board member of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship uh, here in the United States. Um, one of the other things uh, that's really important to know about Peter is that he has been uh, the co-author of, of two, uh, two of probably a handful of books today that exist on Asian American ministry. The first being uh, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents uh, that was written back in the 90s. And most recently, another book called Growing Healthy Asian American Churches uh, that himself, as well as the Catalyst Leadership Center, have helped produce for the Asian American church and Asian American Christians. Uh, with that, he is, I'd like to introduce his plenary. Um, uh, one of the things that um, uh, we wanted Peter to do this morning is offer a 15-year reflection <laughs> Uh, on his book that he co-authored called um, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents. Again, this book was written uh, in uh, the 90s, uh, in, in 1996, and it's been a wonderful resource that I, I've had a chance to kind of rediscover in my own life uh, about really how Asian American Christians kind of negotiate uh, the bicultural tension uh, that uh, many of us, um, uh, between um, the influences of our Asian culture as well, as growing up here in the United States um, in the American culture. Um, so Peter's gonna offer his reflections on that book since he's written it uh, back in 1996. And I'm really, really excited about this plenary um, and what he has to share with us in terms of his reflections. Uh, after uh, Peter's uh, plenary session, uh, I'm gonna have my friend, uh, Pastor uh, J.P. Kang uh, from Japanese Presbyterian Church uh, engage Peter in a time of just questions uh, as well as uh, opening this up for you to be able to answer, or at least to ask your own questions uh, based upon today's plenary. Uh, so with that, uh, would you join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Peter Cha? Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, Billy and uh, uh, SPU leadership team for uh, creating this wonderful space for all of us to gather and to enjoy our conversations. Um, and I also want to thank you for the way that you have been very attentive to small details as well. I noticed next to the eggs and sausage there was a pile of white steamed rice. And as Ken Fong has noted, it's not the kind that don't like to stick to each other. <laughs> but it is a, a sticky rice. And uh, well, my tummy thanks you. Uh, Fifteen years ago, in fact, this was a time when we were working on a book project. I was a, a busy church planting pastor, uh, but also a doctoral student who is trying to work on my dissertation project. And you can only imagine how doing those multiple things just kept my life very busy. In fact, in most of the days, I was not able to be at home for dinner with the family. And one evening when I was home, uh, my son Nathaniel, who was at that time about five or six years old, uh, looked at me and said, Dad, I think you should get a new job. <laughs> so I asked him, so Nathaniel, oh, what, what kind of new job do you think I should get? And apparently he must have thought about this for a while because he said right away, garbage man, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> so then I was kind of puzzled, and so I asked him, why, why garbage man? And this is what he said, because garbage men works only on Wednesdays. <laughs> and for a five-year-old boy, looking at things from street level, that was true. 
He only saw this green garbage truck coming to our street only on Wednesdays. So he must have thought, wouldn't it be great if my dad had that job? <laughs> of course, because he saw the reality in a very incomplete way, right? His conclusion in the end was not correct. But seeing the larger picture, more complete picture, is not just a challenge for a five-year-old boy, but is in fact a challenge for all of us who are engaged in various types of ministries in our local setting, very busy with just a lot of things that are happening in our churches, and some of us are faculty members, the daily and weekly duties sometimes does it make, uh, make very difficult for us to get out of that setting and see the larger picture. And I believe one of the benefits of gatherings like this is inviting us to see the larger picture of what's happening in Asian American context today. What is God doing in the different corners of Asian American communities? Yesterday, we looked at the, the historical picture. Our predecessors, the experiences that they were engaged with. Today, very briefly, I will be looking at some of the current ex issues and experiences, particularly based on the book that a uh, that number of us co-wrote together. And then this evening, uh, friend, my friend Sung Chan will be then helping us to look at the future picture. And as a result of all these uh, perspectives that were brought before you, that it would, God would use it to increase our understanding of the, what is happening. Now, I'm a person who is located in the Midwest. I've been there for 30 years in the Chicago area. I'm a Korean American. Yes, I did have local church ministry, parachurch ministry, and now I'm teaching in a seminary setting. But still, I feel that it is a almost overwhelming task to even talk about you know, the current experiences of this varied Asian American Christian communities. So I'm gonna bring a few pieces uh, to the table, so to speak, to generate and start the conversation. And not with a sense that here is a definitive picture of what's happening presently in Asian American Christian community. And Billy Vo has asked me to, to especially frame my conversations or reflections based on this book that we wrote about 15 years ago. I wish all my co-author friends here, here were able to come this week. It would have been a really engaging conversation. Basically, let me just start out with briefly explaining to you how this book project came about. In the early 90s, as a growing number of Asian American students began to come to our college campuses, parachurch ministry group like University Christian Fellowship realized that all the ministry resources that we had at that time we're not able to effectively address some of the unique and particular challenges that many of these students faced. So then around 1993, InterVarsity Press asked five of us who were either current Ivy staff workers or former Ivy staff worker like myself to come together and collaboratively to work on a book project that would be focusing on the discipleship of Asian American college students. So there were two Chinese Americans, uh, two Korean Americans, and one Japanese American. And so in our first meeting, and because we were geographically dispersed, we couldn't get together all the time, so we had to work separately. But first time we met, and we sort of roughly came up with certain categories of chapters that we wanted to work on. And then we went back to our own regions and worked for about a year, and then came back with our own manuscripts in hand, and we began to read each other's manuscripts. Now, there was a category of evangelism, spiritual formation, how to understand vocational calling, right? All these things. But as we read each other's chapter, there's a one common theme that struck all of us. Now, all of us were in our 30s and 40s at that time, but we were quite surprised to find how prominent our parents were in all those chapters. We don't live with them, but they were in our chapters. <laughs> <clears throat> in fact, one aspect of discipleship that we quickly realized is so much of our pathway of following Christ 
our parents are in that story, sometimes as enablers, and sometimes as voices of challenge and sometimes undermining how we wanted to grow in our spiritual faith, especially those parents who came from non-Christian backgrounds. So one of our co-authors, as we were thinking about how do we name this book, the title, one of them said, half jokingly, we should call it, it's all our parents' fault. <laughs> we didn't go there, right? Instead, we came up with this lengthy title called Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents. That's a mouthful. Now, university editors did not like that title. They said, you really want to sell books? You got to have a short title, like Left Behind. <laughs> well, you know what? We wrestled with that. But this was best we could do. It has a, some sense of ambivalence, some sense of challenge as well as blessing, following Jesus without dishonoring your parents. Well, there are three themes that I want to particularly reflect upon, and there are many other themes that are in there that I could have chosen, but these three themes I want to reflect on today because it has something to do with this bicultural identity that Billy wanted me to address. And the first uh, theme that I want to briefly look at is this notion of understanding and experiencing our bicultural identities as Asian Americans. Now, as I just briefly explained to you, I mean, this book came out of that experience of learning to negotiate between our Asianness and Americanness. Bicultural identity was a very key theme in this book. But I think there has been some significant changes since when we first wrote that book in early and mid 90s and where things are today. And I'd like to broadly point out two perhaps uh, areas in which these bicultural identities have somewhat shifted. One is the set of uh, contexts and experiences that inform us about what it means to be Asian American. Some of the contexts and experiences that inform and shape our understanding of Asian American bicultural identity I think has changed. What does it mean to be Asian? When we wrote that book, and this was in conversation with our college students as well as our own sort of a life stories, I think we understood certain things to be Asian largely because that's what our parents told us. Our understanding of our Asian-ness, our Asian values and practices were very much mediated through our parents' teaching and transmitting of their values and how it got played out in our family life. Now, some of us were aware that what our parents told us what Asian thing is was not exactly how it's being played out in our homeland. In fact, a lot of our parents' peers have moved on, if you will. But our parents being immigrants, right? Whatever subculture or culture that they brought from Korea or Taiwan in 1960s and 70s, sort of those things got, if you will, fossilized. And now we were sort of consuming our parents' selective understanding of what Asianness is. Well, you know today that is not the case. I'm thinking about particularly my children who are now in college and college. They have a direct access to a lot of the cultural artifacts that are being produced in various spots in Asia. My, my daughter, who will be heading out to college this fall, she is constantly checking out on YouTube pieces that features this contemporary hip Korean hip hop artists who are doing their songs and dances. The hip hop music that originally came from certain urban contexts in the United States goes to Korea and they repackage it with their unique moves and, and beats. And now my children, in Chicago, who, by the way, do not know many Korean words, listening to these YouTube pieces and download songs that they're singing. 
So often I find my daughter doing homework in our kitchen table listening to Korean hip hop music. So then I ask her, do you know what they're saying? Nope. <laughs> so, so why? why? Why do you favor this music? My daughter, who, as I said earlier, does not really speak Korean, says there is something about that Korean language that I'm drawn to, that it soothes me. And then I have a son who is now a college junior, and his, his, he and his non-Korean friends, as well as Korean friends on college campus, are now going through Hulu and looking at some of these dramas and movies that are coming out from Asia, right? and consuming these cultural artifacts that are constantly flowing to the United States, transnational flow of these cultural artifacts. And they're following these Korean dramas or there's some movies coming from Japan and Taiwan. Now, when you look at some of those artifacts, to be sure, some of these traditional Asian values like filial piety and loyalty to family, they're there. But often, they're there to be contested. Some of the younger generations who are singing these songs and producing these dramas are in some ways challenging some of these traditional values that have been in their lands for long. Right? So things are messy. And for our children to, to be uh, exposed to and interact with these cultural artifacts, they're getting quite different message than what I got from my parents. Right? Things are more hybrid. Things are more complex. Different questions are being raised. And I'm talking about in Asia than kind of clean set of teachings we got from our parents. If you're Asian, you need to do this. So in some ways, today, it's a bit challenging for us to think about what is East and what is West. In fact, what we call East, there is now a lot of uh, conflict, if you will, a contesting of the traditional Asian values with what might be called today's hypermodern, if not uh, postmodern, forces that are emerging within Korea, within Taiwan, within Hong Kong, and where all these things are mixing together. And my, our children, the younger generation today, how they're being shaped as an Asian person is partly shaped by what's now taking place in this realm of cultural artifacts that are being produced by our homelands, right? So it's no longer just parents' voice. They're exposed to these wider areas of cultural arena that we didn't get to benefit from. But then let's go to American side. On the American side, what does it mean to be now American? You're Asian American. What informs our sense of being from, we're part of America? Now, when we're writing this book, implicitly or explicitly, our understanding of this West, the America, was a white mainstream culture. The very first paragraph of this book, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents, let me just read this short paragraph. It's written by Paul Tokunaga, who is a third generation <clears throat> Japanese American born and raised in the Bay Area. This is what he wrote. On that one to 10 scale, many of us live by. White folk were always a 10. I was convinced as an Asian American that the highest I could ever hit was a seven. I grew up in a predominantly white suburb in the San Francisco Bay Area. It was clear to me, even as a child, that whites set the standards and I had to fit into their society if I was going to prosper or even just survive. Okay, that's how the book begins. So then here is the Asian-ness that we learn from our parents, and then this is, there is this American side, which almost we equated with the white culture, the white standard, and so forth. Well, as we had our conversation last night, well, that notion of what it means to be an American is gradually changing. 
First is the demographic reality that is just rapidly changing right now. Ten years ago or so, when I was coming out of the graduate school and, and I studied in the area of sociology and social ethics, we were told that year 2050 is a critical year because it would be that year when there will no longer be the single numerical majority race group in the United States. In other words, the whites would no longer be numerically the majority group, 2050. Well, you know what? This past year, that got pulled up. Now they're saying it's going to be 2040. And in fact, for the younger generation, right, that tipping point will cut even sooner. So there's a demographic reality that is rapidly changing, but then just as important, if not more, is the more of a cultural reality and, and how our younger generations are being shaped by the multicultural education within their public school. Sometimes I regularly talk to my uh, children about what they're reading when they're going through the public high school. Some of the books that they've read very directly confront the uh, cultural imperialism of the dominant culture in our society, how it has silenced certain minority voices and how we need to elevate some of those voices so that we could have a truly multicultural society and so forth. Right? The kind of books that I was not exposed to going through public education in the United States in the 70s or even during the college. Now these newer generations are learning that and their understanding of what it means to be an American in today's multicultural society is quite different from what my peers and I have learned and internalized. So what it means to be Asian, what it means to be American, the term we often use, Twinkie, banana, I mean, that, I, I wonder if that picture will continue to be. In many ways, it's not going to be. Right? Things are becoming more complex and dynamic. Now, there is a second broad reason why these bicultural identities have shifted during this last 15 years. One is, as I've said earlier, right until now, the context and experiences have changed. But second is how we understand identity formation process has, I think, gone through quite a bit of change. When we wrote that book 15 years ago, this was a sort of a simplistic schema we had. We said, we see that some of our young people are on a one extreme uh, where they overly want to identify with a white mainstream culture, uh, and, and in some ways have a very condescending attitude toward their own ethnic heritage and often become victims to what's often called racial self-hatred. And then we also see some students just swinging the other way. And, and we, again, last night, Tim has pointed out the ethnic tribalism. So in that book, basically, we said, okay, we see this pendulum swinging Maybe the best optimal thing is to somehow come to the middle ground and develop a healthy Asian American bicultural identity where we learn to bring the best of both sides and kind of have a happy balance at the middle ground. That was, I think, what we were advocating in that book. Well, today I think partly because of the researches that have come out since then, that view is questioned. On the one hand, now there is a sort of wide sense of understanding that this thing called identity formation is a lifelong journey and a process. And it's not just for those who are teenagers and early 20-something people. Uh, you know, Eric Erickson and others have very much popularized that understanding that identity formation is a particular project that should that would involve the teenage years and early 20, and then you achieve your identity, and that's the language, identity achievement, and then you move on to other things. Well, that view is no longer really held as, it doesn't have a much consensus. Now, identity is understood as something that you're like, it's a lifelong journey, whether you like it or not. Right? Second thing is, as I said earlier, in this book, we were talking about this 
ethnic and racial identity as if it's something that can be achieved at one point and it would be sort of a balanced, uh, uh, bounded identity. But now, more and more, particularly recent scholars, are proposing this way of thinking that is, no, most people have multiple identities. And often because they are forced to live in multiple worlds, even on a single day, you go from A to B to C to D. And when you are confronted with increasingly multiplying worlds, and sometimes because you are part of it physically, and sometimes, again, because of the digital connections, now people travel through internet, different worldviews, different things, right? They're drawn to that. So then, maybe goal is not to have a permanently achieved ethnic identity, but to learn how to shift your identities as you travel from one location to another and being able to live into that location and have a particular identity there. And then when you move on to another place, whether it be ministry or school, then you assume an, another identity there. I mean, a couple of decades ago, we might have called that a schizophrenia. But now, it's sort of assumed normal condition. I'm wondering about that. I think more and more we are called to be border crossers, boundary crossers, and learn to live into particular places, not just doing a role play, but fully identifying with that context. I wonder if that's what Apostle Paul meant, being a Jew to a Jew, Greek to a Greek. At Trinity, I have a one student in my formation group whose name is Hassan. He is a second generation Korean Pakistani American. Okay? Korean mother, Pakistani father, and grew up in the United States. And now he has been a youth pastor of a Latino church <laughs> in an inner city Chicago, which is surrounded by African American community. I mean, think about his Asian American identity. He's living in multiple worlds, shaped by multiple worlds. And using terms like banana or Twinkie would not at all work with that brother. And I think more and more, that's the kind of the richness that we have to envision for when we say something is Asian American, right? And this issue last night came out as well. Let me move quickly to the church side now. Okay, so if this is some of the stuff that we're wrestling with at the level of individuals, how does this affect the, the life we do together as a church? When we wrote that book, uh, Following Jesus Without Dishonoring Your Parents, there was something that was going on in our Asian immigrant churches, and we called that the silent exodus. And perhaps some of you may have heard of that term. And it simply means that many of our young people who grew up in the, our, our uh, Asian ethnic churches, for a number of reasons now, they're beginning to leave their home church, usually during their college years and post-college years. And, and my good friend Helen Lee wrote that article for Christianity Today and got published in 1996. And I tell you, in the evangelical world, if Christianity Today published something, it's like gospel truth. It must be happening. But even at the empirical level, we knew that was happening because among five of us who wrote that book together, four had already left their Asian ethnic church. Okay? So in our own stories, we were living out this silent exodus thing. Now, as I was writing that book, I began to do adjunct teaching at the seminary I'm teaching now. And I begin to interact with a lot of these young, second generation Asian American seminarians, and I begin to hear their stories, and this is often the story I heard. Well, I guess I have to begin my ministry journey somewhere, so I will start serving in an Asian immigrant church as a youth pastor and so forth. But when I graduate from this 
seminary, I'm going to move on. Okay? Move on. So I'm going to join either some independent churches out there that's focusing on English ministry or join a pan-Asian American church, multi-ethnic church. But you know what? After I got some ministry experience down, then I'm going to go for that ultimate challenge to be part of a multiracial church. So there was a sort of a narrative that was being formed. That narrative was a very, if you will, unidirectional narrative. Right? And often some folks use the language of Acts 1-8. I start with my own Jerusalem. But then next is my Judea and Samaria. And then sort of ends of the world. Now, no doubt, for some of us, that was God's clear calling. And I celebrate that. But to assume that everyone who is going through a seminary training has to go through that pathway, looking back, I think that was a bit too simplistic. So there are some unexpected things began to happen. So about five years ago, I got a call from my youngest brother, who is currently serving in a a church in Washington, D.C. area. In fact, that's a church that my father used to pastor at one point when he, uh, before he passed away. And it's an immigrant church that has a, a good size uh, English ministry, second generation ministry. And then he called me and said, you know, Peter, I, I'm calling you because I'm just seeing something very weird and I don't know how to read this. And, and, and then he basically said, the church always had about 150, 200 people, adults, coming to the English ministry. And all of a sudden, within a year, it went from 200 to 400. And he said, as far as church goes, we didn't do anything different, and we just don't know who these people are. <laughs> well, as he was describing, this was what was coming out. A lot of these folks were who left immigrant church and during the silent exodus era of 1990s, left their immigrant churches, uh, some of them drop out of the church altogether. Some of them went to, you know, some of these mega churches like uh, uh, Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York or Willow Creek, you know, some of the big churches. And now these are the folks who are coming back, and one of the commonality is that their children, so now third generation, are all going through adolescence around that time and beginning to ask the questions about their identity. And whereas some of these churches had a great preaching ministry, even great youth ministry, when some of these identity issues came up, their churches did not have a whole lot of resource to guide these Asian American third kids through the journey of intersecting their spiritual identity with ethnic identity. And in fact, this is my personal testimony. I left an immigrant church in 1992, two years ago. My family, too, ended up coming back to Korean immigrant church because my two children, who were going through adolescent years, while they were quite happy with the church that we were attending at the time, which was predominantly white, when they got to adolescence, something kicked in. And in fact, my daughter, who was a bright girl, <laughs> used the sociology language to get to me. And this is what she said. You know, in my public school, I really envy second generation Indians they're all part of their faith communities, my guess, Hindu. But they know how to articulate their own cultural and ethnic background and the values in a very compelling way. But when they ask me, so Elaine, as a Korean American, uh, what, what's your unique thing? She says, I don't know what to say. And then Elaine said, for me to participate in a larger multicultural conversation, whether it's secular or Christian, I need to first figure out what, what is my thing. And she called herself whitewashed. Okay. So two years ago, we made our way back to Korean immigrant church. And you know what? My two children just thrived in that youth group setting. Now, I don't necessarily think that means that they will stay in a Korean immigrant church long haul, but at least for now, it seems to me that this is a very critical experience that they're having to put some things together for themselves. What surprised me, even as a 
person who's trained in sociology is that I did not anticipate this coming to my third generation kids. But that's what they're expressing, right? For them, it is important to put together some of these unique pieces with their spiritual identity. So as our identities at the individual level are multiplying and some unexpected things happening, it seems like it gets reflected in our congregational lives. So amongst us, there are some of you who are serving an ethnic immigrant church. And we used to think that means just taking care of those recently arrived immigrants settling down in this new land. But now I have a hunch that their mission might go a lot uh, might require more long-term perspective than that just short-term settlement issues. And we have a continuing need for pan-Asian American churches. And we also have a need for multiracial congregations that are led by Asian American leaders. How do we celebrate all these diverse forms and the types of Asian American congregations that are faithful to God's calling for them without elevating one is, in terms of using evolutionary language, one is more complex and the other is more <laughs> earlier forms of evolution or whatever language you often hear on seminary campuses, right? Um, but I want to bring up another thing while we're working on um, uh, talking about church thing, and I know this is not something that was covered in a book, but, but I wanted to bring it up because we are on seminary campus. 1990s, when we were writing book, looking back, I think those were the peak years when the largest number of Asian American young people came to seminaries. 1990s, that's when Trinity Campus, when I, where I did my study and the serve, serving now, we had about 80 to 100 Asian American young people going through our MDiv program. Today, that number is about half. And I'm finding that this is not true of just uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, but across the board. The Association of Theological Schools is an agency that accredits all the seminaries and divinity schools in the United States and Canada. So they collect all this data. And if you go to their uh, website, you will get this data. Apparently, while the population of Asian Americans continue to grow, from 90s to now, and even the number of churches, whether it be Korean, Chinese, and so forth, continually increased, the number of Asian Americans heading to seminaries have plateaued at best or declined. Now, here is a story though. Yes, the number has plateaued, but the number of Asian American students who are going to seminaries who are going into non-MDiv programs have increased, like PhD, THM, counseling. Those who are going into MDiv program actually decline. And not only that, high percentage of Asian Americans who are doing MDiv program do not have a congregational ministry in mind. Many of them are using MDiv program to further their studies in a doctoral program. And then many who pursue MD program are thinking about parachurch groups like InnoVarsity Christian Fellowship. Now, as a person who is teaching at a seminary, I, I do hope that we have a continuing, uh, growing uh, presence of Asian Americans who go through a doctoral program and come teach at schools like SPU and Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. We need their scholarship. And as a board member of University Christian Fellowship, I celebrate the fact that when I left staff work in 1992, there were only 20 Asian American full-time staff workers in IVCF, and today there are 140. That's great. What I lament about is this pipeline that leads to congregational ministry is just shrinking. And this is a hidden crisis that I think churches have not yet addressed. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand or anything because I know many of your pastors here. How many among your church recently, young people or people of any age, sensed God's call to ministry and told you that I'm gonna to go to seminary and really explore about this calling to pastoral ministry? 
how many? And, and then, second question is, how well are you as a congregation assisting, affirming, and supporting them as they go through that arduous journey? Because often, they do not go to seminary with their parents' blessings, even if their parents are pastors and elders. And this is a special challenge for our sisters who hear and sense God's call to ministry. Something we need to think about. I think it's a stewardship issue, but also I think it is a way to ensure a vibrant uh, future for our churches. Let me quickly go to the third one, and, and this one I'm just going to be more brief because last night we had a great conversation about racial identity. And I have a sneaky suspicion that Sung Chan's going to hit this one really hard tonight, too. <laughs> uh, but let me just bring a couple things. One, we wrote that book right after L.A. riot happened. And personally for me, but all of us, we're still wrestling with this question that came out of, in many ways, L.A. riot incident. What is the place for Asian Americans individually and Asian American church? in our racialized society, where often different race groups are pitted against each other. <clears throat> on the one hand, as I look back last 15 years, one of the things that really encourages me is a growing number of uh, younger Asian American pastors and lay leaders who really wrestle with the biblical message for compassion and, and, and justice issues and learning to go beyond their ethnic and the racial borders to serve others who are in need, to come alongside those who are marginalized and stand with them with the gospel, right? I am just convinced that one of the reasons why University Christian Fellowship is continually attracting a lot of these gifted young staff workers and students is because they have found ways to talk about the gospel, about evangelism, but alongside with God's call for us to grow in a commitment to mercy and justice. Young people are drawn to that. And, and today I'm also part of a small denomination called Evangelical Covenant Church. And in 1997, when our church plant went into that denomination, we were told that we were the first English-speaking Asian American church to come into the denomination. And 14 years later, Greg is there. Greg, what's the roughly number of Asian Americans now who have come into Covenant Church? About 35, churches. 35 churches, and most of them freshly planted churches. Right? Now, among all the denominations that have a larger size, tremendous resources, why are these young Asian American pastors coming into ECC? And I do believe it's one of the reasons is that because the denomination has very clearly in an upfront way, uh, articulated its position. While evangelical, we also want to be engaged in a culture and a society with a biblical understanding of mercy and justice. And young people are drawn to that. So those are some hopeful signs. But then last night, we were talking about this ongoing tension that we feel surrounded by between assimilation and separatistic. Right? And Tim, yesterday, using some historical perspectives and incidents and heroes or a certain individuals, brought those two tensions to our, uh, uh, to our conversation. That one, I don't know if we made much headway trying to figure out, as Asian Americans, how do we not just continue our dialogue with our white church partners, but now enter into dialogues with African Americans and Latinos and other groups in finding our voice and finding our location in multicultural Christian communities? That's a project we need to really think through carefully and intentionally. Last week, I was at Duke Divinity School participating in a week-long program that they have called Institute for Re uh, Reconciliation. 
It was a really wonderful gathering of African Americans, Latinos, Caucasians, Asian Americans coming together to think through the common calling that we have from our God to be a part of reconciliation to this broken world. And in that setting, during our morning chapel, a Latino pastor and a theologian offered this beautiful and powerful imagery that kept uh, that captivated my imagination. I want to briefly share that with you and then be done with this. And that is this. As he looks at today's multicultural, multiracial Christian community, he feels like we are invited into a choir rehearsal. And this is what he meant. You know, most choirs, soprano, alto, bass, tenor, and particularly for those of us who are not yet trained in those musical practices, when we join a choir, they ask you to first go with, let's say if you are a bass singer, go to the bass section, and then continually rehearse together as a bass group, right? So they separate it out. The sopranos go one room, or the altos, the bass, you learn your part well by continually rehearsing. And he said, the Asian Americans, the Latinos, African Americans, and Anglos, we are in our rehearse, uh, sectional rehearsal movement. We're learning our parts, learning our voice. But then you never learn to sing the whole song if you remain in that sectional rehearsal whole time. Okay? You may think you have mastered bass part, but you really don't know until everybody comes together to see if you really learned it. But the, the other thing is, you don't know how the whole, whole song goes. Right? I used to sing in a bass part. You don't know what the melody is like. Well, and then when a rehearsal is done, there has to be an occasion where all the people come together. Now begin to sing our part. Christ is the conductor. He's a celestial choir. The picture we see in the Revelation is that we will spend our eternity singing the praise of God, using different cultural blessings and goods that we have picked up along the way, that multi-vocal chorus, right? And if that's the end product, we kind of need to live into that reality even right now, though not fully. And what might that look like? And then he offered a strong critique, sometimes how in a, any given Christian institutional setting, one section often tends to dominate, silencing out other parts, and how that needs to be checked. As Billy mentioned, uh, I'm part of this Catalyst Leadership Center and one of the things that we will be discussing at the board meeting after this thing is over, with envisioning the possibility of hosting a next to Asian North American consultation like we did at Trinity, but this time, half of us will be Asian North American Christian leaders, pastors, theologians, and the other half be Latino theologians and pastors and Christian leaders to come together and start now doing alto and soprano, learn to do that part, let's say. How, how do we, what can we learn from each other given our shared immigration experience? And, and how can we think about doing something together collaboratively? We noticed that a lot of Asian churches send their short-term missionary trips down to Latin America. Are there ways to do even that together well? Can, can Asian American Christians and Latino Christian leaders come together to make our community outreach or community service more effective? Or how about this? Is there a way to bring our voice together as a Christian witnessing communities and speak into the badly needed work of comprehensive immigration reform? 
Those are not going to be easy places though, because those are controversial issues. But I feel that kind of vision now is calling Asian North American communities to envision and think about. And I hope it's gathering like this where we can think outside of our own local church or seminary context and begin to see the larger picture, not only to understand what is actually happening right now, we may not see the total picture, which we need to see, but the other thing is, it's often in a gatherings like this, it may be more clear to us what might be our God's larger calling for this sectional group and how God might invite us to, into this larger harmonious chorus. Thank you. Uh, in listening to Peter, um, I just heard so much of my own story uh, reflected in the many things he was talking about. I entered seminary in the fall of 1992, right after the LA riots. And uh, my cohort of entering Asian American, Korean American students came from cities like Chicago, San Francisco, uh, upstate New Jersey, and I had just moved from Boston. And we represented sort of different experiences. And I think it's important at a conference like this that we recognize how important our own personal location is as we begin our discussion. Because as we have heard several times already, the, the terms Asian and American are in a sense uh, wide and even moving targets. So just a brief uh, word of introduction. Um, I'm second generation Korean American. I was born in the United States to Korean American uh, immigrants who came in the early and mid 60s. My father came to study theology at Union Seminary in Richmond, Virginia. My mother came as a student nurse uh, to the East Coast. And they met and married in the States. I was born in Wheeling, West Virginia. Um, it was the closest hospital to the town in Ohio where my father was uh, pastoring a church. But shortly after I was born, uh, my parents were commissioned to be missionaries for the Presbyterian Church. So I had a sister who was born in Korea and a younger sis youngest sister who was born in France while my parents were doing language study in preparation to go to Africa for a three-year term in Zaire. So my earliest memories in my life are of being in the African countryside and we came back to the States for a one-year home assignment, or furlough as it was called then. And then after that, we were sent for two terms to Japan. So I grew up uh, my formative years in Tokyo and Fukuoka and attended American and international schools with a lot of other missionary kids, uh, embassy kids, multinational corporation kids. So when I came back to the United States in 88 for college, it was uh, a kind of culture shock for me. I was a US citizen, but suddenly I was encountering a lot of other Asian Americans, and in particular, Korean Americans. And during my four years in undergrad, uh, I wrestled with a lot of these identity issues as I, I, my faith was deepened and challenged. And eventually, um, I discerned a call to seminary. Didn't know where it would lead at that point. Uh, to make a long story short, I went to Princeton Seminary. And uh, under the influence of my teachers there, I, I went on. So I'm one of those uh, people who entered with, uh, at that time, as an MDiv and went on to do a doctorate in Bible. Uh, but the door that was opened after uh, graduation was to parish ministry. And so now I am serving, have been serving for almost two years as the associate pastor of the Japanese Presbyterian Church here in Seattle. And for someone like me, having come from about 15 years of, of ministry work in the Korean American setting with youth, first youth and then college and young adults, uh, which was a very much of an immigrant setting, two languages, um, generational issues. I am now in a congregation with easily four generations. Uh, one day last week, I went to visit a 90-some-year-old in the hospital, and later in the afternoon, I was with a, one of my youth students and her family. And that's the kind of experience that um, has really enriched my own understanding of what it means for me to be an Asian American uh, Christian. So with that brief word, um, I would like to uh, engage uh, uh, Peter with a couple of questions. One is uh, I wanted to... Um, lift up this, 
notion of identity formation as not something that you achieve uh, in your mid-20s or whatever, but something that's a lifelong process. And the, the question I would like to ask you to comment on would be, in what ways uh, can our churches facilitate that? What kinds of um, theological shifts, or perhaps even just to talk uh, in a way that we're common, how do we use the Bible, for, for example, in enabling people to think about vocation, think about identity? So is, is that clear? Can, can you maybe address that briefly? Yeah, by the way, this uh, sense of uh, identity formation as not just two, three year project, but a long lifelong journey is not something that only face, that the Asian Americans are burdened by, but for everyone. In fact, uh, one of the things that I'm seeing on a seminary campus is, especially when I interact with the faculty members who've been teaching there for a long time, often these are what I'm hearing. You know, 20, 30 years ago were the good old days when students who came to seminary knew who they were. <laughs> and they were so certain about being called to church pastoral ministry. So all we had to teach them was Greek, Hebrew, church history, and they're out. <laughs> but now, my goodness, these young people, they don't know how to make commitment. They're always saying, I'm exploring this. I'm exploring this. Right? <laughs> That they're, they're afraid of making a long-term commitment. And boy, what is this generation? How is this generation going to lead the church? And at that point, at the faculty meeting, I and a few others had to bring up this. Maybe there is a fear of commitment, but I think a larger issue is. See, vocational calling is a part of identity, making an identity understanding. Vocational identity is a very important concept. And, and going through their uh, life experiences in current context, where there are so many options and so many choices, and then even this implicit notion that your identity making is a lifelong journey. I mean, lay people may not explicitly say it that way, but I think everybody knows that identity is not something you're settled after your high school or college. So they're always in a journey mode. They're always in an exploration mode. And for me, rather than saying that is a lack of commitment and other things, we need to come alongside them as a church and reclaim that imagery of faith is journey as well. Discipleship is a journey. And all these things has to enter into that, that notion of following Christ, right? Even if your sense of identity is not so clear at this point. So uh, with that, I, one of the things that I'm thinking about, um, particularly about identity formation, is that um, whenever I'm in, uh, uh, involved in some kind of mentoring of a younger Asian American pastors, uh, Catalyst has been doing some of those projects. It's intriguing that one of the books that many of these younger Asian American pastors are really drawn to is Henry Noun's book, called The Return of the Prodigal Son. They know he's Catholic, and some of these reform guys, <laughs> they usually don't turn to Catholic authors to, to be refreshed. But that book speaks to them, because there is a good chunk in that book that addresses identity issue. And this is how Henry Noun puts it. Your understanding of who you are is largely shaped by the voice of that person whom you deeply respect and look up to and who that person says you are begins to really shape powerfully your understanding. And in that book he says, uh, when, when we are at that space where we're able to regularly hear our God's voice that tells us that you are my beloved child, that has to be sort of foundation of our Christian journey. If that is true, then I challenge my younger pastors. Okay, you yourselves, but also so many that you're ministering to, they're wrestling with this identity issues. Are we intentionally then creating a space in our corporate worship, creating a space in our discipleship, creating a space in our own individual 
devotional life, where each day, or even several times each day, that we are at that space to hear our God's voice that says, you are my beloved. You are my beloved child. I know it sounds like a very simple thing, but that intentionality of hearing God's voice afresh, regularly, I think an important spiritual discipline. The second thing, and different denomination uses the different language to talk about this, I think Lordship of Christ is a concept that needs to be in some ways reclaimed. It's a, it's a term that was very, very dominant when I was going through staff work in early, mid 80s. Lordship of Christ, it simply means that as a followers of Christ, we learn to yield all areas of our lives to Christ and that he be the Lord in all aspects of my life. And one of the things that troubles me when I talk with a number of the staff workers these days is that language of Lordship of Christ sort of disappeared. In fact, in the inner varsity circle for a while, we replaced that with the language of leadership of Christ. Now, I totally understand why they went that route because Lordship, I mean, what is Lord? Sounds oppressive. Leadership, I kind of understand. But then I think we lose quite a bit of a theological meaning when we go from lordship to leadership. Especially in today's culture where we are just suspicious of all these leaders who seem to be having moral failures every day. Right? The notion that yes, we have a very, in some ways, fragmented aspects to our life, fragmented ident identities, but learning to submit all those disparate elements to Christ's lordship, I think is a spiritual discipline, theological category we need to. So I'm basically saying, are there ways that we could help our lay people and ourselves to continually integrate these diversifying pieces that are often pull different directions? Can we create that theological and biblical space where helping them to now bring those disparate things together and make something unique out of that. And it does not mean necessarily everybody has to have a same identity or same vocational calling, but integrating those things, I think, needs to be modeled, and in some ways, uh, the space needs to be made available. I don't know if I'm addressing your question. That's, that's very helpful. Um, we have about 10 minutes, and we'd like to uh, give you, uh, those of you who've been listening, a chance to ask your question. So we have one question over here. Oh. Can you speak up? Um, we don't have to revamp. I want to quote Deborah Jin Han, Mark Han's sister, wrote a whole chapter on multivocality in our book, Mirrored Reflections reframing biblical characters. So there's a uh, Ya, Christian Ya, M.Y. Huang, mm -hmm. not Kohlberg or Eric Erickson. The title is Interdependence in Ethnic Identity and Self Implications for Theory and Practice. Mm -hmm. It's in Journal of Counseling and Development, 2000. Mm -hmm. I, I would like you to utilize this. There's a powerful story of what it's like to have shifting identity that's not schizophrenic, mm -hmm. but multivocality as an asset. African American women is talk about shifting selves, and I think uh, you would benefit because Deborah Jean Hearn, professor at Azusa Pacific University, looked at Ruth, biblical characters shifting identities, and she's no longer pathological. It, it is a tearjerker. So I brought four copies, and first come first. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I think uh, Young Lee Hurtig is pointing to an asset that our churches often have not utilized. When we wrote 1995, The Following Jesus, there were not too many resources out there, secular or Christian, that addressed helpful way the Asian American issues. Today, we really don't have excuse. On the one hand, there are a lot of wonderful secular academic research is being done, but then we also have scholars like Young Lee Hurtig and Tim Seng and other colleagues that they're working with. They're helpfully bringing these current scholarship and then contextualize them 
for our Christian journey individually and church. So uh, I know, Tim, you have a handbook there, right? That's another book that now I'm using on my seminary campus as a textbook. It's a very accessible book. It's got the articles written by different folks. Uh, so uh, one of the things that when I talk, talk about 15 years then and now, one of the changes that there is now richness of resources that are available through the Christian scholarship as well as secular scholarship. Uh, and and I, I hope that the churches really take advantage of that. Hi, uh, Peter. Um, thank you for your talk, and I want to focus on your narrative about the um, si uh, silent exodus of the second generation. Yes. And then, more interestingly, what I call, or maybe you call, the silent return. Silent return, okay. Of the third generation. <laughs> right. My question is, is the silent return um, applicable to all of the ethnic churches, or are there only some that uh, our children will return to. What are those conditions? Right. No, that's a very good Can question. Can those conditions tell us a little bit more about Asian American identity? Sure. Thank you. Um, what do you call silent return? Uh, I, I, I've done some interviews and some studies of a number of congregations in the Chicago area, Toronto area, New York, New Jersey, and Washington, D.C., about those churches that seem to be experiencing the silent return, and try to see what are some commonalities that are shared by these churches. Um, well, let me first point out that a lot of these folks who left the immigrant church left because they were hurt and injured by a number of things that happened in the immigrant church. So it's not easy for them to even think about coming back. And part of that means they are not indiscriminate about which church to go to. Just because it's an ethnic immigrant church, they're not heading there, uh, partly because of their growing up experiences and what they remembered, and particularly, I think, uh, our sisters, uh, who often felt very painfully injured in their immigrant churches. For them to come back to a similar setting is not an easy journey. So then there has to be something about these churches that are really kind of pulling them. And one of the things that I see is uh, when I talk to the individuals who have come back, uh, there are two or three things, actually. One is if it's an ethnic immigrant church that has an ethnic language speaking group and English speaking group, they want to be able to see there is a measurable, healthy relationship between the two. They don't want to go into a setting where there is ongoing war going on. And partly that means on the both sides, there are senior pastors or pastoral staffs that have developed a fairly healthy long-term relationship. So it seems like, you know, it, is this safe place for me to go? Is it safe place for me to return to? And, and so that, you know, healthy interdependence model, and today I know there's a workshop that Paul Kim and others, Andrew and others are working on that, about intergenerational relationship. And that church that uh, one of the speakers, Paul Kim, is working on, actually, that's my home church, they have done something very intentional about shaping that intergenerational partnership over a period of 20 years. And that track record, I think, in many ways, has helped many of these returner, returnees to feel like, okay, this is a different kind of church than what I have anticipated. The second thing is that the church is, of course, the, the, as a returning parents, they're hoping that the church has a, a fairly vibrant and a healthy youth group, college group, because they're returning for their children. Uh, is it the kind of place my, ch now my children can come back and, and be on their faith journey? And, and uh, you know, so that, that's that element. Um, third, this is not as huge, but this is I heard often. Many of these young people are, these are now people in their 40s coming back. Often they are now living with their parents. Their aging parents have decided to move into their household because of physical you know, decline and so forth. And so often these multi-generational now families are looking for a church where all of them can go together and worship. And so you know, does that church have a, a presence of other elderly who, who, with whom their parents can be friends. 
so forth, right? So part of it is a life stage issue, isn't it? 40 something, you're a sandwich generation, you're caring for your elderly parents who are declining in health, but you're also trying to address this uh, third generation identity issue. Is there a church that could somehow, you know, help us with all this? So often the immigrant churches that, that are uh, uh, developing this kind of ministry seem to benefit from that. One of the things that I did not point out is the side benefit of this happening, silent returnee. They're coming back, not as the same person they, who, uh, when they left 20s. And many of them actually have gone to some of these other churches where they were very actively engaged in, let's say, ministry to the community, ministry to the poor. And it's kind of interesting now, they're bringing those, if you will, values into these immigrant ethnic churches and really energizing that. So what they have experienced in Samaria, if you will, now they're bringing back to their Jerusalem so that their Jerusalem church will no longer be the same. It's kind of, wow. It's a very healthy interaction that's happening that's benefiting both the church and those individuals.